I actually crammed quite a lot in this morning because if you see what I've put on, you know, I, I'm trying to take a bigger picture of the Christmas story. Um, and I was hoping that it would help engage you, get you thinking, that the songs at times would lift you and just make you want to worship him because ultimately that is what it's all about. Um, I mean, yesterday I, I have asked, I did ask for some peculiar scriptures, perhaps ones not so much read during Christmas services and Christmas meetings. Um, and maybe they left you scratching your head. I mean, where were the traditional stories? I didn't get you reading the the, the shepherds or the wise men. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope that, you know, and, and you know, you normally read those uh, alongside the more traditional favourite carols, which I hope at least you had some of those that were your favourites. And even the passage I spell to read about, with, which, it, which um, we read in part, um, a few dwell on the bit about the role of Joseph in the story itself. Yet, yet the reason I included that clip earlier on that was called Someone's Coming, I wanted to just remind us that the Christmas story is more than a nice little narration about Joseph, Mary and baby Jesus, of cute angels and sweet lambs being held by shepherd boys, of pretty stars and unusual gifts. This moment in time is a life-changing moment. It's a world-changing moment. It's a moment captured in time that impacts the whole of time. It's a moment of seeming helplessness that sent ripples throughout the whole universe and it altered my eternal future. A moment that was planned by God from a start a few thousand years ago that took place in a very small and significant village that is still impacting lives today and will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. In the story, acted out by infants in front of proud parents, making us feel good and warm inside. Yet when you think about it, it's pretty offensive. Mm -hmm. See, if we go back to the passage in Genesis, if I can get my slide to move. There we go. We actually sang this in the unusual verse that was included in Heart the Herald. In Genesis 3, we have, we read, And I will make enemies of you and the woman, he's talking to the serpent, and of your offspring and her descendant. That's Eve, Eve's descendant. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. You see, Adam and Eve had sinned, as we know. They deliberately disobeyed God and by eating the forbidden fruit from the tree in the Garden of Eden. And nothing we could do, as a result, evil entered our world and humanity was separated from God. Nothing we could do could make up for our sin. And God being just and righteous, banned us from the Garden of and brought judgment that has continued on throughout generation upon generation in humanity. Yet even as God was cursing the perpetrators in the third chapter, the very first book of the Bible. He was already concocting a plan to redeem the world and reconcile humanity back to himself. Yes, the serpent would bruise his heel. Yes, Satan would engineer Jesus's death. Jesus ultimately would triumph and bring that reconciliation for us by becoming sin and taking our punishment and in so doing, deal that crushing, deadly blow on Satan's head. Mm. We read, I'm familiar with the story of the road to Emmaus, where we know there were those two walking there, despondent because Jesus had died, and how Jesus appeared to them. And as he spoke to them, he showed them in the scriptures all the passages referring to himself. And bearing in mind that was all they had was the Old Testament, none of our New Testament. And I often wonder, did Jesus start with this scripture? And then carried on, pointed to them how he fulfilled the scripture in all that he did and when he rose again. And so we continued on and we came to Isaiah, where we came to the story of King Ahaz. The armies of Syria and the army of Ephraim, which was North Judea, had come up against them. And it says the hearts of the people were shaken like trees in a gale. God told him not to be afraid and offered to give him a sign, any sign he wanted. 
to demonstrate that he was with them and in control. But he refused in a very pious sounding excuse. So God gave him a sign anyway. And Debbie read, and we were reminded in the um, video, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel, a twofold prophecy that pointed to immediate fulfillment in the time of King Ahaz, in part, but a complete fulfillment in the future when we look to Jesus. Moreover, when we then read in chapter 10 that a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, and Prince of Peace, as the last video reminded us. We can see that God had a plan. We can see that God had timing, and his timing was perfect. The Israelites could see a Messiah was coming. They taught it. They prayed for it. This even spread beyond the boundaries of Israel as the people were taken into captivity. We read how Daniel, whilst in captivity in Babylon, was promoted to the head of the wise men, the head of the Magi. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was through his diligent tra training of the Magi. Many generations later, they recognized the fulfillment of this biblical prophecy and came in search of the Messiah, whilst the Jews were blissfully ignorant of what was happening around them. And why not? After all, Jesus' appearance was not all at all kingly. He was not born into royalty, although Matthew is at pains to tell us in chapter one and show us his royal genealogy. And he arrived with such shame and ignominy. After all, we read that Mary was betrothed to Joseph. She had covenanted to marry Joseph and to keep herself for him and for him alone. And in the same way, he had covenanted himself to her. And as was the custom in Jew the, Jew the Jewish nation at the time, she would wait 12 months before the marriage ceremony, part of which was to prove her faithfulness of that promise. That she would not go after another. And yet she calls Joseph to the side and says, I'm pregnant. And he knows the child is not his child. I mean, can you imagine the betrayal that Joseph felt? Have you ever been in a position when someone has blown away your trust? They've betrayed you. They've betrayed your trust. Here we are in a small town or large village in Galilee where most people knew each other. Where I imagine word got round very quickly, faster than Burnham Community Church. <laughs> cannot be hidden easily. And especially when your unmarried fiancé begins to look like... She has eaten one too many falafel pitters. But it becomes obvious that overeating was not the reason for her weight gain. Can you imagine how he felt? Can you imagine? Charles Spurgeon said Joseph was saddened and perplexed when he learned that she would become a mother before they had been actually married. Many would have thrust her away in indignation and put her to an open shame. But Joseph was of royal mind as well as royal race. He would not expose what he thought to be the sin of his espoused wife. Although he felt that she must be away, he would do it quietly. When we have to do a severe thing, let us choose the tenderest manner. Maybe we shall not have to do it at all. Can you see how God chose wisely here? Not only did he find a woman of good character to bear his son, but he also found a fiancé of strong character, a royal mind as well as royal race. Don't you? I love that quote. What a lovely quote. He would be royal of mind. He would help her quietly. Yes, the wedding was off. Yes, she had betrayed him. But he would still gently help her through the time and assist her in avoiding shame. Joseph was a devout man who knew his scriptures. He wanted to do what was right and not offend God. He was a good Jew. He was faithful to the word, an honourable man who would behave honourably. But whilst contemplating all this and processing what must be a confusing message in his mind, he went to bed and fell asleep. And whilst he was asleep, we are told an angel appeared in dream and told him to marry Mary, that their child was holy, 
and when born to call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Being a righteous man, Joseph did as the angel commanded. He married Mary, and we are told when the baby was born, he called him Jesus. But can you imagine the shame, the heightened whispering that went around behind them around the town? Questions asked about their fidelity, about their behaviour before their marriage. Yes, meet my wife, Mary. Well, yes, she is pregnant. How many months? Oh, around seven. And how long was marriage? Well, a couple of months. But don't worry, we didn't do anything. Uh, the baby's not mine. Actually, I think he would not have exposed Mary like that. He took on the shame for her, on her behalf. It may have cost him an honoured place in the synagogue, and he'd given plenty of fodder for the town gossips to use. But he mm -hmm. affirms the truth of what the angel told him. But what a way to arrive. Why did God not choose a happy married couple? Why didn't he pick a betrothed couple but visit the mother the day before they got married? Instead, the key players in the most significant drama on the earth to endure the shame and indignity of the situation. But before we then go back to the charming little manger scene and forget about the offence that Joseph or the shame that Joseph and Mary must have had to endure with their sinful behaviour by failing to follow the law, according to what people saw. And we go back to that scene with all those little animals looking on, illuminated by the bright star from the sky. Let's not forget the angel's statement. You will be called Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. Why was Jesus born? Because we had sinned. He did not need to be born if we had not sinned. Christmas is about our sin. Not avoid that message. A bit of muting. There's quite a bit of background noise going on. There we go. There we go. Where was I? So we cannot avoid the message. Christmas is about our sin. As much as it's as, as much as we would love that charming little picture, it points back to us and says, For your sin he became man that he would die. Jesus cannot save us from something that does not exist. And Jesus was, was born so that many years later he would endure the agonies of torture and the pains of crucifixion so that he could save us from our sin. And more than that, this child was going to be called El Gibor, Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us. This baby born into a disgraced family, lying in a food trough amongst the animals, was mighty God. Was the everlasting father, even though he couldn't even father a child yet. What nonsense, what idiocy, what offence. Yeah, as, John, as Packer once said. Oh, hang on down. As, as, as J.I. As J. Packer said. If only my mouse would work. The Christmas message rests on the staggering fact that the child in the manger was God. I remember Bill Johnson once quoting somebody when I heard him speak uh, just outside Reading. He said that God often offends the mind to test the attitude of the heart. Uh, we are prepared to allow our minds to be offended so that we can let our hearts accept God's truth. Simple truth, yes but shrouded in such complexity that it makes it hard to grasp the truth of what we're being told by the angels and through the prophets. It drew me to think about the circumstances right now, what feelings people are expressing right now. You see, I've seen fear and anger as people have dreaded the reported impact of the COVID virus on our population and the limitations that are imposed upon our lifestyles. 
fear that one day we may succumb to this pandemic. I've seen senses of hopelessness as people wonder if this will ever end, hanging on to a promises from politicians and scientists who claim to have the solution almost within grasp and yet keep changing their minds. Mm. I see confusion as we try to understand what is happening. How do we pick through the various messages that bombard us daily through social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, the BBC, Sky, the news media? I've seen so many lonely and isolated on their own, behind closed doors with no one to talk to and no grasp of modern technology to be able to communicate through this media. A very poor bedfellow when you consider all the fear and confusion that's taking place too. So no surprise that mental health is becoming an increasing issue amongst the population. And one thing I've really started to notice this week is a huge amount of self-righteousness that's given people the right to point fingers and judge others for breaking rules, for failing to bow down to the altar of science and accept the salvation on offer through the vaccine, to bring condemnation on all those who fail to comply, as many are waking up today where they are more like caged animals than human beings. So in whom do I trust, I found myself asking. In whom are we trusting right now? Scientific research, man-made solutions, solutions devised by political committees, or this child lying in the manger, the mighty God, El Gibor. Are you living in constant fear of the future, or have you accepted the peace offered by this priest amongst the prince amongst all princes. I have seen so many fellow friends of mine from Christian congregations uh, back home in Reading and elsewhere who have just perpetuated fear and the uncertainty and confusion. And yet our message the truth of Christmas is mighty God has come to presence himself amongst us. He is Emmanuel and he brings us peace and answers and can get away from all the chains of confusion, of hopelessness and isolation. After all, our concern should be more about our eternal future not our short past. But in all this, the Christmas message brings us back to earth with a bump. Jesus came because we are sinners and he came to die to set us free. For the self-righteous statements, the judgmental attitudes and finger pointing that is going on, we need to reflect that he has given everything to us who have nothing. That he forsook the wonders of heaven. Just imagine it's beyond comprehension. The wonders of heaven to come to earth to rescue us. Can you imagine what it would be like moving from our comfort now to something that is just completely incomprehensibly uncomfortable? Because that's what he did. That he loved us to tell us the doorway to heaven is wide open. And he will welcome anyone who turns to him and chooses to come inside. No wonder the angels were crying out, glory to God, glory to God. What an amazing God that he would do that for us. Tim Keller wrote, Christmas is the end of thinking you are better than someone else because Christmas is telling you that you could never get to heaven on your own. God had to come to you. It is telling you that people who are saved are not those who have arisen through their own ability to be what God wants them to be. Salvation comes to those who are willing to admit how weak they are. Let's not forget how weak we are and leave ourselves in the hands of El Gibor. And John Packer said, the Christmas message is there that is that there is hope for ruined humanity, 
hope of pardon, hope of peace with God, hope of glory, because of the Father's will, Jesus became poor and was born in a stable, so that 30 years later he might hang on a cross. It is the most wonderful message that the world has ever heard or will hear. For those of us who accept this truth and give our lives to it, comes the assurance of eternal salvation, knowledge that we become and are children of God. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king.